Well, greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. We're under a blizzard warning right now, so it looks like I have a few minutes to work on a video. A few days ago, I put up a challenge to the Flat Earth community to disprove a video from the ISS. The Flat Earth has put forth their champion. Let's see how he does. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is the International Space Station. I'm ready for the event. Lockview High School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. This is a live interaction between Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield and a Canadian high school in 2013. Station, this is John Monroe, teacher at Lockview High School in Fall River, Nova Scotia. How do you hear us? John and uh, Lockview High School and everybody in Falls River, yes, I read you loud and clear from the space station. How's the weather up there? <laughs> the weather is uh, hot in the sun and cold in the shade and nice here inside. Well, we have some great questions for you, Mr. Commander Atfield, so I'm going to send it over to David St. Jacques and he'll get the questions going. Now, just so you understand, the interaction with the space station will occur continuously with no cuts. Chris, we have the winners of the Science Challenge with us here. Kendra Lemke and Meredith Faulkner in grade 10. And we were wondering if you had the possibility to do their experiment for us in space. We're going to be cutting to the video, but the ISS feed will continue. I do. Uh, thank you for the invitation to do so. I personally can vouch for the existence of an object that has the, the shape and outline of the ISS that orbits the Earth in its predicted positions. I've seen it many times from my backyard, and I've even photographed it twice transiting the sun. But let's take a look at some NASA footage and claims of why this supports that it's all fake. These claims will generally fall into three categories wires, zero-g plane, and CGI. Well, you're probably missing the last one, the fact that they can just have an object fly by the moon to simulate it. It's not hard. It's really that simple. Now, here's another example of what I'm going to show you. Um, what this is flying by the moon is actually a satellite balloon, which, if I'm correct, can only go about... 20 miles high, maybe a little less, around there. It can fly by the moon and it's giving off a shadow. Yeah, you're kind of in the dust right there. So that's not the ISS. That's probably a drone or just like another plane type object flying by it. That's all it is. Okay, so this champion that goes by the name of Why You Are an Idiot seems to believe that all satellites are balloons that fly overhead. Of course, they fly overhead at a point that can be timed to the second in case anybody happens to be sitting there with a P-1000 trying to get a picture of them. Meredith and Kendra suggested that I dip this in a bag, but bags don't hold water in space, so instead I filled a water bag. This has drinking water in it. And I'm going to uh, squirt a bunch of water into this washcloth. Now, something that I want to make clear about parabolic flight, you have 1,000 meters as you're near the top of this curve that you're weightless. Then you have another 1,000 meters coming down until you start picking up weight again. That gives you 20 seconds of weightlessness. For every 10 seconds of weightlessness, you need to fall another 1,000 meters before pulling out. And he clearly knows this time is limited to 15 seconds, but listen to him try and work his way around it. Now, why did it take so long? Just go higher. That's it. Go higher and try and come down slower. Now, there's several ways you can probably do this. Now, one of them is 
basically pivoting down and then curving in kind of like a circle form to still get the same effect, but, you know, slow it down a little. He has a basic misunderstanding of this entire problem. It is not your speed. It is the time it takes you to descend 1,000 meters. To get five minutes of weightlessness, this aircraft would have to climb an additional 48,000 meters. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's, let's start wringing it out. Let's see what it looks like in a zero-G aircraft. It's really wet. We'll put them both up next to each other. You tell me which one is in a constant zero-G environment and which one is an aircraft in a dive. It's becoming a tube of water. It looks very cool. The water's running up my hands a little bit. Hey, Tom, can you come grab me a towel, please? I got one on the wall. Notice the bubbles. Buoyancy doesn't work in zero Gs. That destroys the entire density buoyancy argument against gravity right here in this shot. Look at the bubbles. So, I'd it'd be on the other side of Sebus there, stuck on the wall. So... Notice the change in sound as the microphone floats away. The water is all over my hands, in fact. It rings out of the cloth into my hands. And if I let go of the cloth carefully, the water sort of has it stick to my hand. The surface tension of the water keeps it stuck to my hand. Thanks, Tom. grab the microphone. Okay, so the uh, experiment worked beautifully. And the answer to the question is, the water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it, um, it actually runs along the surface of the cloth, and then up into my hand, almost like you had jello on your hands, or gel on your hand, and it'll just stay there. Wonderful moisturizer on my hands. And the cloth doesn't really unravel itself. It just stays there floating like a, uh, like a dog's chew toy, soaking wet. Great experiment, worked perfectly. Meredith and Kendra, congratulations, great idea. Thank you, Chris. I know everybody was thinking in their own mind, <laughs> ah, we see you better now, thank you. Everybody here was thinking, what will happen to that water? And uh, who had predicted this? Raise your hands if you had predicted this. Ah, I see a couple of hands there, that's good. Well, science is like that. You think a benign experiment will just be an obvious result? No, no, it can be very surprising. So, very creative idea. Thank you. Uh, our champion here decides to go off into silliness. Here he's trying to show the ancient Egyptians had helicopters, I guess. Uh, hi, Chris. I'm Meredith. Uh, how has your perspective of humans changed since viewing the world from Earth to viewing the world from space? Rather than give airtime to nonsense, let's listen to Chris's answer to this question. How has my perspective of humans changed? Uh, it's an interesting question, Meredith, because you really have time to reflect when you're so far from home. You know, there are six of us on board, and we are completely separate from the other six and a half billion of the rest of us. And so you feel that physical separation. But it, it may be surprising to you, but in fact, I feel closer to everyone, I think, as a result. When you, when you live in your house, in your street, in your town, in your province, in your country, you tend to identify those things almost like, like layers of a fortress around yourself. You know, I'm from this place, and, and, and all those things are barriers between you and everybody else. And even travel tends to break that down. But to be in a position where you can go around the world in 92 minutes and see every place over and over and over again, those barriers um, fade. 
And of course, I still see the strife and, and the stupid things we do, like what happened yesterday in Boston and, and then the suffering we have to put through, like the enormous earthquake in Iran today. Things still happen. And some people still horribly misbehave. But the vast majority of people are good. And people are just trying to find joy and raise their children well and, and find grace in life. And for me up here, um, I found partway through the flight, I just feel like I refer to everybody as just us. It's all of us together in this. And, and so I think it's a perspective that some people get naturally and that some people will never get. But I know it's a perspective that having the chance to see the world the way I've been trying to show it through the pictures I've been sending back, it's a perspective that you definitely get um, when you live on board a space station. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is a very moving answer. Now, returning to the silliness, here's what um, our champion thinks a satellite actually is. Just think what it would take to predict the exact location to the second of this balloon for years to come. Now, on top of the fact that the satellite balloon is literally casting a shadow on the moon itself, uh, we still have the issue of satellites. There are so many satellites in the sky that there should be, what, like 15 to 30 satellites passing by the moon every 10 to 20 minutes, like on a consistent basis. So basically, if you got a telescope, you should be able to see satellites all the time. We never see that, ever. Okay, just to show what utter rubbish this is, let's have a look at the ISS transiting the moon. It'll come in from the 8 o'clock position there, see it? It's crossing the moon's face now, and it'll come out around 2 o'clock on the moon. There it is. See it? Here's a telescope with an equatorial mount to help track satellites, and let's have a look at a few of those. And then we have all these satellites just a whizzing by. You see the one going from the right in the middle of the frame there from top to bottom? There's several of them. Here, he'll point a couple of them out. Look at the large star in the middle. There's a pair of satellites passing just to the right. Again, watch the star in the middle. A satellite will pass just to the right, and he'll turn on the equatorial amount and will follow the satellite. Pretty cool for satellites that don't exist, according to our champion. Not to mention the moon only being 20 miles away. Recall that his excuse is that they're all weather balloons with satellites attached to them. Yet we can predict exactly where to look for them, at what time, to the second, and they appear. You can't do that with a balloon that's just randomly going through the wind in the upper atmosphere. So like his claim that this is all done on an aircraft in parabolic flight, this is all utter nonsense. Remember, to get five minutes of weightlessness, you need to climb to an altitude of approximately 150,000 feet. Look at the weightless clock. Remember our discussion on orbital speeds and Kepler's laws? Let's see what he has to say about them. Thanks, Chris. Allie has a question for you. Hi, Chris. My name is Allie. I'm in grade 9, and my question is, how long does it take to orbit Earth? Allie, it depends how far away you are. If you think about the Earth orbiting the sun, it takes us 365 and a quarter days. 364 and a quarter days? Anyway, one year, uh, plus a leap year every four. And uh, so that's because we're, whatever, 93 million miles from the sun. The moon takes one month to go around the world because it's 400,000 kilometers away. But sort of like a ball on a string, on a long, long string, you can spin it fairly slowly and the ball will stay up. But if it's a little short string, you have to spin it really fast or the ball will fall down. Sort of the same idea in orbit. Because the moon's a long ways away, it goes around the world about once a month. But the space station is much closer and we have to go, if we have to go around the world every hour and a half. 
and our exact altitude here, about 400 kilometers, means we have to orbit the world every 92 minutes. If we were a little further away, we'd go around the world more slowly. If we were closer, we'd have to go around faster. And one last thing, there's one orbit in between the moon that takes a month and the space station, which takes an hour and a half, there is an orbit where it takes exactly 24 hours to go around the world, if you think about it, right? One month, 90 minutes, there's some orbit, some distance, exactly 24 hours. So if you can orbit at exactly 24 hours around, that means you'll stay above the same place on the Earth, because the Earth takes 24 hours to turn around. It's a really valuable orbit for a satellite, because you can bounce your signal off it all day. And that's how I'm talking to you, in fact, off one of those satellites. But for us, 92 minutes, once around, 16 times a day. Okay, I'm going to conclude my portion of this video here shortly. I want to thank all of the Flat Earthers that uh, left comments on the original video. Unfortunately, 99% of them were basically personal incredulity. Yes, we do have a space station in orbit in space above the surface of our spherical earth. It goes around once every 92 minutes. We can clearly see it with a telescope. We know exactly where to look for it with a telescope because we understand Kepler's laws of motion. This has been nearly 19 continuous minutes of weightlessness. This is not possible on an aircraft flying a parabolic flight. We've seen that that is limited to 15 to 20 seconds. Aircraft cannot reach high enough to do even five minutes, much less nearly 20, of continuous weightlessness. There are no cuts in this video. It is before a live audience at a high school in Nova Scotia. Not a single flat earther has posted that they called the school and found out that this event did not take place as reported. Not a single flat earther, including the one that made this video, has offered anything to say how this is faked. So let's give Chris some closing words. But there's something else to remember. If you look at the world, it is huge and beautiful and ancient. And the world has been here for four and a half billion years. We've only been here for the blink of an eye. We tend to think we're really, really important. But it were only important when we look in the mirror. The world has endured some incredible cataclysmic things in the past. And we're definitely not always doing it good. But uh, there's a lot of the world that is still in pristine condition. So we can do better. We need to do better. But don't despair. Uh, there's still a huge amount of resource in our planet. We just need to take better care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commander Hatfield. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, if you don't mind, give us a shout out on Twitter. I'm sure we're all following you on Twitter. All the pictures that you great are, are excellent. Thank you so much. And have a great journey back on May 13th. Do you want to talk more? Do you want me to say more? Oh. Thank you very much. And congratulations again to the winners. And Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. You lock you high school station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. This rabbit hole's too deep for me.